Yeah, a very good morning to all the participants. Uh, I welcome you to the last day of this uh, Northeast Center for Technology Application and Reach Nectar sponsored one week entrepreneurship development program on flexible 3D printing and prototype development. Uh, so today we are really pleased to have amongst us uh, Mr. Karthik BA from Adviz Wipro 3D Bangalore. Uh, he will be delivering a talk on design for additive manufacturing with a focus on topology optimization. So uh, with this, I hand over the session to Mr. Karthik. Uh, Karthik, you may start the session. Sure, sir. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen and we can get started. So a brief introduction about myself. I work at Wipro 3D as an advice solutions engineer. I have a background in metal additive manufacturing. I did my MS from Linköping University, Sweden, where I focused on working with metal uh, components for various space and aerospace applications. So I worked with both uh, laser powder bed fusion as well as electron beam melting. And today I'll be imparting some uh, aspects of the design for additive manufacturing and how it is crucial for design for additive manufacturing and the perspective that we bring in when we design components for additive manufacturing. And basically the, is my slide changing? Okay, yes, so yes. the, the outline for the agenda for the agenda for today will be basically an introduction to metal AM. I know most of you might be aware of this, but I'll just be going over the brief uh, different sorts of metal additive manufacturing and how the design considerations for those vary with the different sorts of uh, AM technique. And following that, we'll go into the framework and the consolidated workflow when it comes to designing for additive manufacturing. We'll have a few industrial case studies as well, and then a couple of mitigation strategies as to how to address the various challenges which we come across when it uh, when we are designing a component in terms of additive manufacturing. <clears throat> so when we first look at additive manufacturing in general, just to go over the basics, uh, it's basically when we take a CAD model and we use a, a tessellation software or a slicing software, which basically breaks down the CAD model into multiple layers. And then we fabricate the component on a layer by layer basis until the finished product is obtained. So this is the gist of the additive manufacturing technology, but then this varies in the different types of uh, techniques that we use. Sometimes it is uh, raw material in the form of a powder. Sometimes it is Uh, just a moment, let me pull out a pointer. Yes, so basically when we use, when we say powder bed fusion, we are basically spreading the raw material onto a build platform and then fabricating the component. But if you're using an FTM or say a wire-based uh, technique, or in some cases say, direct energy deposition technique. In that case, the process of application varies, but the end result remains the same. And we need to think about how we are going to approach this uh, technique and what are the design considerations we need to uh, take uh, or make note of before we go into the designing aspect for a component being fabricated by the various techniques. Now, when we look at metal additive manufacturing, it is broadly classified into several different types and one of them being powder bed fusion. So basically when we say powder bed fusion, the raw material in the, is in the form of a powdered material, which is being spread onto the build platform. We have various energy sources, which can either be a laser in case of selective laser melting or laser powder bed fusion, as it's called more commonly in the industry, uh, where we have a laser as the energy source used to melt the component in a desired shape. And we also have another type of 
powder bed fusion technique, which is called the electron beam melting. The primary difference is that the energy source instead of a laser is an electron beam and the entire process is primarily carried out in the presence of vacuum, whereas in case of laser powder bed fusion, we use inert gas atmosphere to fabricate the component. Coming to direct energy deposition, basically, again, we use the raw material in the form of a powder, but we have a nozzle which basically blows the raw material onto the build platform. And again, we have an incident uh, energy source. So this energy source, again, can be either laser or an electron beam, depending upon the technique. But what you will notice is that basically when the powder is blown from the nozzle, the energy source melts this powder and it gets deposited onto the build platform on a layer by layer basis. This is the primary difference between powder bed fusion and direct energy deposition. Again, we have a few other types of uh, metal additive manufacturing. Primarily, we have material extrusion similar to the fused deposition modeling or fused filament fabrication, which we use for uh, polymers. But in this case, we use a metallic filament. So again, layer by layer fabrication, but the green part, which is fabricator needs to be sintered or some sort of post uh, processing is to be carried out in order to get a good surface finish. We also have binder jetting this again, metal binder jetting in case of metals. We have the raw material in the form of a powder and we have a binding agent. So basically for each layer of fabrication, once the powder is, is spread onto the build platform, we have a binding agent. This binding agent varies depending upon the raw material type or the type of raw material. And the binding agent also, for certain applications, we have multiple binding agents and certain applications, it's restricted. There are quite a lot of factors which we consider in this technique, but primary the process is that the binding agent holds the raw material in the desired shape, following which there's a curing time and then a fresh layer of raw material is spread onto the build platform and the process is again repeated. But once the component is fabricated, we generally do some sort of a heating or some other post-processing technique, not just to center the components together in a, for more strength, but also to remove the excess binding agent, which is present in between the powdered particles. Lastly, we have material jetting or nanoparticle jetting for metals. This is a rather newer technology. So basically it's the same process as uh, the direct energy deposition or material jetting. But in this case, the particles which we utilize are on a very small level, far more smaller than what we use conventionally for powder bed fusion. So basically fabrication of components which are very small are uh, generally what we prefer this technique for. And it's a rather developing technique, which is why you will not find as many applications of this as you will find in say the powder bed fusion, which is most commonly utilized in the industry today. I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of the process of powder bed fusion because this is what plays a fundamental role when we look at design for additive manufacturing. So the basically the working principle is such that we have a dispenser duct, a building platform and a collector unit within the machine. The dispenser duct holds the raw material and a recoater basically spreads the raw material onto the build platform. And the energy source, which in this case is a laser for laser powder bed fusion, melts the raw material in the desired shape. And once this initial layer is done, the build platform lowers by the layer height, whichever has been predetermined -de during the parameter setting stage. And this dispenser duct increases in height by the same layer thickness. And then we have the recoater, which basically spreads the raw material again onto the build platform and the process is repeated to get the desired product. And the excess material in case drawn from the dispenser duct is pushed into the collector duct. That is the basic operating principle. I will show you a video just to show how this happens. Most of you might already be aware of this, but it's always helpful to get a good a perspective of the fabrication process. So basically here you will see that the laser is melting the raw material onto a, 
onto the build platform. And you'll see that it's first melting the hatch or what we call the bulk region of the component. And lastly, you will see that it does melts the contour region, which is basically the boundary of the component in order to get a good surface finish. And again, the parameters can be controlled, various parameters of the equipment in order to determine what is the basically the width of the laser, the speed, the energy that is being utilized. The So this is the contour which you saw along the so now we see the recoder spreading the new layer of raw material and basically the printing continues. So various parameters are there. If you see initial, in the previous layer, the laser was melting the raw material in a vertical direction, but now you will see that it's in our angle. So these are some of the features which we control and vary in order to reduce the residual stresses in order to better get a cohesion or homogeneous uh, a joining of various layers to avoid things like delaminations and things of that nature. So there are quite a lot of parameters which we can control. In Selecto Laser Melting, it's generally about roughly 250 parameters. And we can vary all of them. And for a, a, someone from a design background who is designing a component for additive manufacturing, it is essential for them to understand these parameters so that they can make the most of the design freedom which is available while fabricating a component with metal additive manufacturing. So coming to the design freedoms, basically topology optimization and weight reduction play a significant role. So what we try to do is that because we are fabricating a component with an additive manufacturing technique, we are not restricted to the conventional designs which we utilize for conventional manufacturing techniques. So if you see this component, you'll find there are two components which have the exact same application. The bracket, which is basically fabricated by ALSI 10MG, which is the aluminum raw material available for fabrication in metal additive manufacturing. By keeping the functionality aspect of the component same, we vary the component's design and its structural integrity. So basically, when we look at a component from my metal AM point of view, what we think is what are the most crucial functional areas of the component and everything else, as long as it's not very important, we try to modify it if at all required. So in this case, you will see that since this is a flat surface, that it is prone to a large amount of deflections. And by going with a completely unorthodox design, while the functional aspect of the component remains the same, we have made sure that the structural integrity of the component is maintained, while the deflections which we would otherwise face with the conventional fabrication technique has been reduced. We have reduced it by up to 73%. And also the weight of the component has been significantly reduced. So when it comes to design for additive manufacturing, the primary focus which we have is that the functionality aspect on how the part should be utilized, what its applications are, should remain constant. And everywhere else, if you can improve the strength, if you can reduce the raw material, all these factors can be explored to make the most optimal design for the specified application. And that is what we'll be looking into in a more detailed manner as we progress. This is a case study which we did carried out. So basically for a heat sink, you will see that this is a conventional heat sink, which is number zero. And these are the various iterations we did. When it comes to heat sinks, primarily for different applications, we have different uh, requirements like turbulent flows, lamina flows, these sort of requirements vary from industry to industry. What we did is we fabricated various components with various designs to reduce the, the weight to increase the surface area as much as possible. And we found that this quantity, this number four, which basically has a very less surface area and mass performed quite well when compared to the components with higher surface area for its specific applications. Now, these are things which we normally would not even think about because the basics of heat sink is that more surface area for better heat dissipation. 
but when we look at it from an application point of view, we are able to design newer components which are not strictly by the book and but they address the functionality aspect and the application of the component and the need that it has to serve is completely met. These are a few other examples of heat exchangers. Typically, heat exchangers for, say, the semiconductor industry or electrical industries, these are small, very small uh, components which have a very uh, huge restrictions in terms of space and where they can be installed. So with additive manufacturing, since we are fabricating it on a layer by layer basis, we have the design freedom to make it highly uh, application based. Its functionality can be focused and highlighted. For example, this component is fabricated in an angle, but this is basically it will be closed. This has been cut by us to show to people that this intricate uh, structures on internally which have been achieved by 3D printing or additive manufacturing cannot be conventionally fabricated. And this is another example. Basically, these fins which you see on this platform all vary in thickness. So fabricating this uh, is quite a challenge with conventional manufacturing technique. But with 3D printing, we are able to fabricate these sort of uh, intricate geometries with uh, more ease. And when it comes to designing, we are able to explore many more options, which normally if you're fabricating this with say a machining process, the tool itself has a chance to either uh, damage or you know deflect this sort of fins which are present over here. And these sort of challenges are what can be avoided by using metal 3D printing. And designing plays a crucial role when it comes to the additive manufacturing technique in general. Another important terminology often utilized in design for additive manufacturing is monolithization. So this uh, compressor valve, which you see, is utilized in the oil and gas industry. And primarily, they were fabricated as 27 different individual pins, which were welded onto the spider holder and then onto the stern. By monolithizing the component, that is, we have combined all these 29 components into a single component, thereby reducing the time for assembly, the, uh, the defects which tend to occur while welding the components to another part. These sort of defects are completely removed and we can fabricate the entire component in a single build, thereby reducing the lead time as well. So these are sort of the applications which we look for, the components which we design. And since these are not typically your uh, uh, very crucial components, failures of which can cause massive you know, loss to the industry. These are smaller components that we have started off with. And if you are able to get these right, we can slowly up, apply the same uh, techniques into more uh, larger and more challenging components with a more uh, important applications or a more stressful applications. A few more examples of components that have been monolithized. So basically this is a feed cluster for space application. So when we have components where the functionality, say a component has to be at a specific location from another component, by monolithizing it, we are able to ensure that the components, the locations are as accurate as possible. And by giving these internal ribs and external ribs to, we are not just maintaining the positional accuracy, but we are also helping improve the structural uh, integrity of the component. A couple of more examples. These are this is a component for the gyro application in space, and for satellites, we'll go into details of these components. We have a few components for cryogenic applications, the oil and gas industries. So basically, reducing the part count is some is an advantage which we have when it comes to additive manufacturing. We can just integrate the mating part onto this this component which you're fabricating and thereby reduce the lead time and you know make it more efficient when you're reducing the number of components basically the the assembly process is being completely eliminated so we are having advantages in times of in terms of time as well as the cost 
So these are factors which, you know, while designing a component itself, we consider especially for additive manufacturing. So what, additive engineering, basically, when we use the term additive engineering, it is the implementation of existing designs and knowledges for conventional manufacturing techniques, which we need to rethink them and reevaluate them and implement them for additive manufacturing process as well. It is often that we are restricted by our conventional design thinking and because additive manufacturing gives us the freedom to fabricate components on a layer by layer basis, the design freedom which we have is not being completely utilized. And this is where additive engineering plays a crucial role. And for especially people who are newly entering the industry and for entrepreneurs who are identifying components, either new components or legacy components, these are factors that have to have, have to be thought of in detail. One of the primary challenges with uh, laser powder bed fusion in general for metals is that there are high residual stressors which are being generated. This is primarily because the build platform after every layer is fabricated, it moves down by a certain height. And say 1000 layers in, we are going to find that the height between the, the layer which is being melted and the first layer where the fabrication process started is quite high. And this difference in height is going to in turn affect the variation in the temperature as well between the base of the build platform as well as the current layer which is being fabricated. So this variation in the temperature is going to lead to the generation of thermal gradients and in turn there are going to be significantly high residual stresses present. So while we are fabricating a component, we need to also consider that the component has to be stress relieved if necessary. And while designing a component also, we need to keep this in mind because there is a high probability of warpages and uh, deviations which might occur due to the, the residual stresses which are being present. If you see these images, basically during heating and cooling, you can see the warpages that occurs. Yeah, and we'll see this in in live example in the next slide. So if the stress relieving is not done, basically you will find warp pages like this when you're wire cutting the component from the build platform. Coming to support structures, basically fabrication of uh, overhangs. So if you're fabricating a cantilever, even of one mm in length, you're not going to be able to fabricate that from that dimension successfully because the loose powder powder is not the best platform to support a cantilever structure. As a result, we uh, incorporate support structures. The support structures don't just help us structurally in maintaining the dimensional accuracy or the intended structure, but they also help in heat dissipation the better flow of heat and the supports also act as heat sinks while anchoring the component to the pair, to the build platform. And yes, to a certain degree, they help us in getting the desired uh, geometrical uh, requirement. But you also need to remember that support structures inherently are basically raw materials which are going to waste. So these support structures are basically increasing the cost of your component. And while designing a component, you need to keep the cost as low as possible and keep the material wastage also as low as possible. And from a designer's point of view, we need to consider how to eliminate these support structures, if not how to reduce them as much as possible. Now, like I mentioned about overhangs, basically when you are having overhangs, we are not going to be able to fabricate them without any support structure. But over the years, after multiple iterations, we have found that for every material, there is a self-sustaining angle or a self-supporting angle. And this angle varies based on the material. We have found that for most metals, if you are having the angle of fabrication more than 30 
300 degree to 45 degree, you will find that the angled overhang is self-supporting. So basically you are completely eliminating the need for support structures. As a result, you are going to find that the amount of raw material which is being utilized for supports is less. So basically the wastages are less and as a result, the cost is less. Additionally, there are a few other overhangs and to fabricate these overhangs, you will find that if an overhang is supported on two different ends, it is more easier to fabricate the overhang. Additionally, like I mentioned about the angle, there are various tests which we perform during the fab before the fabrication to determine if the overhang is feasible or not. If you see beyond 45 degree, the component of the structure is well uh, self-supported. Whereas if you reduce it, the self-supporting angle below 30 degrees, you will find that it tends to collapse because of the lack of support. And these are considerations that we need to make while designing a component. And it doesn't have to be just a structure like this. It can be anywhere, a small 1 mm thickness. Instead of having this, if you make a chamfer or things of that nature, you might be able to eliminate the need for overhangs and support structures in general. So coming to a more uh, practical application, so taking a component, we have found that in additive manufacturing, you may be aware that the orientation of the part is a key feature. The orientation not just uh, affects the cost of the component, but it also significantly affects the uh, application or the performance of the component, which is why we say that additively manufactured components are anisotropic because the direction of fabrication plays a significant role in its application or in its performance. So for this component, we found that this is the best orientation for the for its current application. And if you see various features highlighted in this component, you will notice that, for example, here, we have had a 7 mm overhang. By simply changing the 7 mm overhang to a 45 degree angle, we have made it self-supporting. And as a result, there is no need to make a support structure over here. Because in such locations, even if you do fabricate a support structure, you are not going to be able to remove it easily. We also need to consider the fact that support structures at a later point have to be machined. And then once they are machined, the finish or the surface finish requirements have also to need to be met. And so by changing the angle and making it 45 degrees, we have completely eliminated the need for support. Another example is this location here, basically to what you see on the component where the pointer is. So over here again, it's just a 1 mm overhang and it does not make sense to waste material to fabricate or to do a support structure and you know later remove it. And when you have to remove a support structure from here, you will not. Sign by is equal to zero. And then test three. I think someone was unmuted, uh, no, no issues. So basically when you have a support structure here, you will find that uh, sometimes it is difficult to identify where the support structure ends and where the component begins. So you don't want to mistakenly you know, shift the location where you're cutting the support structure off and in turn end up damaging the component and this entire part goes to waste. So for that reason, we made uh, Rather than giving this exact uh, overhang over here, we merged this overhang with the area beneath and thereby removing the need for a support structure. And these are subtle changes which we make from a design point of view to get a successful build. And they may not be very fancy or a showy sort of a change, but these are things that a designer has to consider in order to ensure that the build is successful. This is another prime example of the location. So basically we have a radii of about 8 mm over here. Now circles are also a challenge to fabricate with uh, additive manufacturing. I will get into details of that as we proceed. But over here we have removed the 8 mm radii and made it a 45 degree angle and now the 
application wise this component is still going to perform as it is intended but making this change just makes it easier for the fabrication so these are things which from a design perspective we need to consider again in this component if you see you will notice that all these lines where areas where the red color is highlighted they were all overhangs and by making it a, as a fillet of 45 degree we have made sure that it is one it is self supporting and two there is no need for raw material because frankly uh, making a support structure in this location is kind of impossible for us to remove and from the post processing point of view these are things that we need to consider especially during the design stage itself Now, when it comes to design considerations for support structures, creation of support structures in itself is quite an intense uh, exercise, mainly because you need to find out where the various support structures are being fabricated and consider if it is feasible for us to remove it post fabrication or not. Secondly, these newly uh, melted uh, surfaces, which are basically supporting us, they help us maintain the, the structural integrity. They prevent deformations of thin wall structures and other intricate features of the component. They aid in heat dissipation. And of course, the sacrificial support structures enable building of overhangs and you know delicate features. And these can at a later date be removed while maintaining the overhang and keeping that intact. So uh, uh, an example when it comes to the industrial application, this is a fuel injection nozzle used in the satellite application. We find that this is the initial design and if you see it, basically this central unit is the nozzle and all the components to, or the structures towards the sides are all basically only for the support and using design for additive manufacturing we have made this a supportless design so basically there are no support structures required we have just varied the angle to a certain degree to ensure that there is no need for support structures if you had to fabricate this design with additive manufacturing you're going to need support structures along this region you need support structures here because this is clearly an overhang so there's going to be a lot of material wastages. If you notice, you will see that we have reduced the amount of raw material used in this region as well. And so basically the weight has been at the end of the day reduced by 22.5%. And if you consider these space applications, you will understand that every gram of weight which is reduced plays a significant role in delivering the payload to the space. So that is why we prefer components like this and design for additive manufacturing is plays a very vital role when it comes to fabricating and realizing these components. So this was the Cairo housing initially, which I was talking about. So initially these were eight different uh, circular units which were mounted or welded onto the central uh, unit. So basically it was nine different components and it isn't always feasible for us to eliminate support structures. It's, uh, during some design stages, we have to uh, give support structures, especially because we built this entire uh, component as a monolith. So it's a single uh, build and the dimensions are about 280 by 280 by 300 in height. So meaning that it almost completely utilized our build platform. A typical build platform for metal additive manufacturing, the, the fabrication area that we have to work with is anywhere between a cube of 250 mm uh, to a cube of about 400 mm. So that is the dimension that the machines in industry today are basically able to fabricate a component and your component has to fit within the size to fabricate it. And if you see, this is the build platform down and you can see the size of the component when compared to the build platform. It utilized nearly the entire uh, build volume to fabricate a component of this size and to successfully fabricate a component of this size, it was it's quite a challenge when it comes to additive manufacturing and designing again plays a significant role. Additionally, when it is not feasible to completely eliminate the supports, we can always reduce the uh, 
uh, support structures, we can give various features like honeycombs or a hollow sort of support structures in order to save time and material. Again, sometimes you will find that when you're designing a component for additive manufacturing, there will be, you know, the simulation in case we do it, all the results will be positive. But when we are actually going to remove the support structures, there will be minor changes. Like in this case, this 90 degree change at, uh, structure over here was a hindrance for us to remove this component. So basically these three units which you see are all support structures and they had to be removed. <clears throat> and this 90 degree angle over here was causing a trouble because this part was getting damaged while removing the support structure. So post fabrication and post, sorry, before fabric fabrication and post the simulation stage of the designing process, we found that this got highlighted as a challenge. And so we needed to make uh, design changes for the specific region. And by making it a fillet, we have reduced the chances of damages being caused. You know, sometimes it will become very difficult for us to even identify this sort of uh, uh, challenges or this sort of shapes in normally when we are fabricating the component, which is why we make sure to simulate the, uh, the design before we actually go into the fabrication process in general. <clears throat> so previously I was talking about the holes and how holes are quite a challenge to fabricate with uh, additive manufacturing. That is primarily because the orientation in which we are fabricating a hole plays a significant role in how successful the build is going to be. So we have found that generally when holes are of 5 mm dia and higher, we will not get a good surface finish or the upper region of the circular hole will not be uniform and you will find it's similar to a collapse of the overhangs or if it is less than the self-supporting angle for an overhang, the same sort of um, uh, surface imperfection will be visible for diameters, for holes with diameters more than 5 mm. And anything less than 4 mm, we found that it is self-supporting. So when it comes to fabrication of orifices and holes, we need to consider what are the different alternatives. Yes, it is always possible for us to create a support structure within the hole, but then if you remove this, say post fabrication during the post processing technique, when you remove this support structure, how are you going to get this complete circle uh, refabricated? You're going to have deviations and maybe there's a small damage and things of that nature, which you need to consider. So there are drawbacks with giving support structures as well. Which is why we found that another mitigation strategy would be to have teardrop designs. So teardrop designs, basically, they give us the same functionality while reducing the chance for uh, collapses like this. Additionally, it is possible for us to basically make the circular hole into a diamond shaped design. So if you have a diamond shaped design, like shown over here, you will find that since it is all 45, sorry, 90, 90, and 90 degrees. They become, they're more than 45 degrees, so they become basically self-supporting. And once the fabrication is done, you can machine it to get a circular diameter hole. So these are ways that we need to consider how to design the component, especially when you're building it in, say, this sort of a build direction. If this component was, say, rotated by 90 degrees to be built around along the horizontal direction, you will find that the circular fabrication is quite easy. But in that case, the application of the component might be significantly affected. So at times when we cannot change the orientation of the component, we need to go for mitigation strategies for holes and uh, orifices. And these are some of the ways by in which we can address those challenges. So we spoke about overhangs, we spoke about holes, one more major challenge we face during fabrication of components, at least from a production point, is fabrication of walls. And basically walls with uh, thicknesses less than 0.8 mm are challenging to build, especially beyond a height of 8 to 10 mm.
Excuse me. Now, this is primarily because of what we call the recoder action. If you have noticed the video during the fabrication of the fabrication process, which I showed initially, you will see that the recoder spreads a new layer of raw material after each layer is built. And during this time, the recoder exerts some pressure onto the component which is being fabricated or onto the build platform. And as a result, this pressure which is being exerted by the recoder is enough to sometimes uh, deflect and damage this thin walls. As a result, we need to consider what are the ways to mitigate these challenges. And it is in some cases possible to fabricate walls even thinner than 0.8 mm, but certain conditions have to be met for that. For that, the conditions primarily are that the surrounding feature should either be able to support the structure or the part geometry itself. And the various AM machine parameter adjustments can also be done. When we say various AM machine parameters to be adjusted, the type of recoder which we are using, now normally machines come with a hard recoder, but varying that or changing that to a soft recoder, say a rubber based recoder, or if the recoder edges are having brushes like the ones which we find on the toothbrush, we find that the load exerted onto the build platform is drastically reduced. As a result, you will not have damages of the wall structures. So also the minimum realizable wall thickness is significantly uh, dependent on the type of material and the height. So these are a few examples of how various walls can be fabricated. So if it is supported on either side, you will find that we can build uh, thin walls of heights exceeding this dimension. And additionally, if walls are supported at the bottom, you will find that they are also, we can fabricate uh, thin wall structures to a fairly higher degree. So this component is an example. If you'll see the diameter of this component is 342. So basically it's a telescope assembly and this utilizes the entire build platform. And there isn't much support structures or any area where we can give support structures to fabricate this dimension. And the height of this uh, component is uh, 245 mm. So what we did is in terms of design aspect, we changed this one mm wall thickness to 1.5 mm. So there we have increased the amount of raw material which is being utilized and we have also increased the cost of production but what we have done is this internal component which is which was conventionally fabricated with some other technique and then welded onto this uh, telescope assembly was now made monolithized so we have reduced the lead time and the cost of uh, fabricating this separately the cost of welding and the defects and imperfections that come with welding. All these have been reduced. So as a result, although we are having an increase in wall thickness and the cost uh, increase, we have reduced the lead time of the component and which is why this was acceptable for the from the client's perspective. But yes, at some cases, say these overhangs, again, we had to make uh, support structures and these were quite a challenge. But there are challenges and from a design point of view, we need to consider that since we just increased the wall thickness, we were able to fabricate a component of this size, which is in which in itself is quite a challenge to fabricate because of the size restrictions with additive manufacturing. So these are some of the factors and considerations we make when it comes to walls. Now, initially I said that the Additive manufacture components in general are anisotropic. So basically the building direction or the build orientation of the part plays a very important role. So coming to that aspect, a part can be fabricated in one of the four different ways you're seeing on screen. So it's either X, Y, or Z direction. And you will find that when irrespective of how you fabricate the component, say this component has a tensile loading application. If you fabricate it along Z direction with a layer by layer basis, you will find that it tends to break 
in between the layers. So the strength will not be as good as if this component say was fabricated along X direction. But we need to also consider that the support structures have to be generated for these three components or pretty much for all of them. And we need to identify the locations where surface structure, uh, support structures are to be given. And we need to also factor in that we need to remove the support structures. And additionally, the cost of fabrication, the higher the height of the component, the more longer the machine has to run, the more is the cost. Because we, when we spread the raw material onto the build platform, you're pretty much covering the entire build platform. So for this component, you'll find that the build chamber is filled till this height with raw material. So that inherently increases the cost. But if you angle this component, you will find that the support structures at this internal places by making it more than 45 degree, we completely eliminate the need for support structures at such intricate uh, locations. But the amount of raw material which is being wasted and as the support structures is significantly high. So that also the cost is going to uh, increase. And from a cost perspective, the designer has to see what is the application and how much it's feasible. And this pretty much varies from application to application. But the major considerations we have to do at arriving the optimal orientation is the critical features like this, the internal uh, chambers or thin wall structures, the height basically because the height plays a significant role in the cost. The build time again, because that is also directly affecting the uh, component uh, and the amount of time your machine is running. And lastly, we have the material consumption because again, we are covering the entire build platform and as a result, you will find that the amount of raw material which is being utilized is also high. So these are factors we have to consider while designing the component and while orienting the component prior to actual fabrication. This is an example of part orientation. So again, this is a cave and orthomer trans transducer utilized for space application. So if you see these structures over here, these are basically hollow tubes. And it isn't possible for us to give support structures inside because we pretty just cannot machine these support structures out. So we had to work with the orientation of the component from a design perspective. And we had to orient it such that these angles are more than 45 degree. And for aluminum, it was a bit lesser, around 35 to be precise. And by varying this orientation, we reduced the support structures or we eliminated the support structures completely at the internal orifices and giving the support structures only on the external side, which could be machined and uh, later that we can get the desired surface finish. So these are how, this is how the part orientation is also from a design perspective plays a significant role. So when we are designing a component, we also need to consider that there is always going to be chances of failures and the major cause for a build failure or for scrapping a build is the failure of the support structures. So you will see that the support failure results in over 25% of the uh, part uh, scrapping. So this image is a prime example. If you'll notice that the component is quite large. So this is the base plate for a reference. So after fabricating a component up till a little higher than what is visible in the image, we found that there is a small crack in the support structure over here. And as a result, this entire build had to be basically scrapped. So these are sorts of challenges which we face with support structure failure. Another important cause of failure is the recoated collision, which I mentioned. So this accounts for nearly 20% of build failures. Basically, the force of the recoated onto the component will result in deviations, delaminations, or bendings of thin wall structures. Additionally, we have shrink lines. So basically, since the heating and cooling occurs at a very rapid uh, rate, we find that the shrinkage lines, which are 
often being uh, generated are not these shrinkage lines are basically not acceptable in by the industry standards especially for applications of aerospace and space so if you find a line or a shrinkage line onto the film on the party the component in general is being uh, eliminated or being discarded and these sort of things can be uh, mitigated at the design stage itself or at the simulation of the design stage and another factor for causes of build failure is overheating. Uh, we also have few other reasons like if the purging or the, the internal chamber in the build chamber or the internal pressure in the build chamber is not adequate or if the quality of the inert gas which is utilized in the build chamber is not up to the mark. There are reasons that the machine will stop printing and Sometimes in some applications, especially for space applications, if the part build stops in middle for any reason, the part is often rejected. So there are several factors for uh, part uh, failure or the build failure and the designing plays a key role in mitigation in mitigating these uh, challenge, challenges, especially when it comes to build failures. Excuse me. So coming to the entire process from designing to the, the build file generation before the part fabrication, we basically use the uh, design file or the CAD model, which is given to design and optimize the component for additive manufacturing. Once the part has been fabricated, we work on the orientation of the part. Because again, like I mentioned, the orientation of the part plays an important role in the application and how the part performs in it during its application. <clears throat> so in this regard, we work with the part orientation significantly. Once the orientation has been finalized, we go to support generation, where we basically generate the various support structures and to see if the support structures are adequate for a successful build or not. Once the support generation has been done, we move forward with what is called as the process simulation. We basically do a thermomechanical process simulation to see if the build will be successful. Is there any chances of failures and things of that nature? And depending upon what we find, in case of any, if there are any surface deviations, distortions or residual stresses are high, if the mechanical properties are not as per our requirement, we go to various stages and we improve them. And once that is done, we run the simulation again. And then only we move forward with the final uh, build file. And then we go ahead with the part fabrication. So when we're looking at say prototyping or say developing legacy components with uh, additive manufacturing these are the factors that we need to consider and this is a result of the thermomechanical simulation which we carried out and you'll find that there is not much uh, surface deviations at the various locations which is why we went forward with the fabrication of the component Coming to a brief description of the overview for us at here at Wipro 3D. Basically, the process flow is such that when we get a component, it is either initially either a legacy data for a component which has to be uh, fabricated, an old component which has to be refabricated using additive manufacturing uh, technique, or we have a new product for which we have the CAD file. Once that is done, we make design improvements for which we basically consider the functional improvements, part consolidation, basically if you can monolithize it or not, reducing the weight wherever possible, uh, the functional uh, integration and the, the functionality of the component will be maintained and the other uh, aspects will be varied wherever we are able to and wherever we are allowed to and performance enhancements are also done, which is a, a key feature. Once that is done and the design has been finalized, we move forward with the application-based simulation. 
Now, in terms of application-based simulation, we are going to have the structural dynamics, the CFT, mechanical analysis, all these are being carried out during the application-based simulation of the design model. Once that is done, we go ahead with the AM process simulation. Now, process simulation basically uh, focuses on the surface defects, delaminations, and things which are more oriented towards the process, the AM process in general, rather than just how good the design is. If these results are satisfactory, we move forward with the production. If not, we go back to the additive design considerations again, and we work on the overhang, critical features, accuracy, surface roughness, and these features which generally get highlighted during the AM process simulation. We go back, we readdress this, and then we do another application-based simulation and a process simulation. And only then we move forward with the actual part fabrication or the process planning for the fabrication. So this entire thing from the initial uh, the CAD file or reverse engineering a legacy data to obtain a CAD file to doing this simulation and making sure that the simulation results are satisfactory. All of this falls under additive design and it's the role of a person working on design for additive manufacturing. So the design person has to also know the uh, the software based analysis. He needs to know how the mechanical properties uh, get affected with the design. And th this is why the additive manufacturing, especially design for additive manufacturing is a very challenging uh, field. And it is something, it's a very intense uh, exercise in general to make sure that only if these things are successful and satisfactory results have been obtained only then we can move forward with the fabrication of the actual component so i will get into the basically design process capabilities so when we either in say for example we get a component which is a three decade old uh, aerospace component which is an example of a component we have fabricated so when components are very old, so which is why we use the term legacy components, these components we generally do not have material uh, data or the spec sheet for what the OEM or the manufacturer initially utilized. Now these sort of components, when you look at it, you can see that today with the advancements in technology, we are having materials which can far outperform the materials of say decades ago. And as a result, we can first re uh, do the reverse engineering of the component to make sure that the CAD file is available. And in these cases, once the CAD file is done, once the design optimization is done, we can look for newer materials which are available in the industry today and suggest the client that there are better materials in today's world which can better perform the requirements of the component and thereby remake those components with the newer materials and that is something which is highly feasible with additive manufacturing especially because reverse engineering a legacy component falls under the prototyping aspect and for this purpose when we come to reverse engineering the softwares we generally use are polyworks or any cmm or a 3d scanner to gen gather the point cloud data. And using that, we can use any design software to create the STL uh, file. And once a CAD model is done, we generally utilize um, analysis softwares like Ansys or Altair in Fusion 360 here at Wipro 3D to do the various analysis and to determine if the component of the 3D uh, model which you've got is uh, satisfactory or not. Once that is done, we move to either softwares like Materialize uh, Magix, which we use for generating support structures. We also have things like NetFab, which again is utilized for support generation. Once the support generation, part orientation, process parameters, all these are carried out, even the thermomechanical analysis is done. We move forward with the 
printing of the component and for the thermomechanical analysis and process simulations as such we use simufact software like simufact which uh, help us to understand if the build is going to stop it at any point or not and once these are done we move forward with the part fabrication so this is an example so this is a shroud impeller used in oil and gas applications so basically this is what the legacy component we got and reverse scanning was basically or reverse engineering and 3d scanning was carried out to get a brief what do you call description of the CAD model which you are going to generate but what is important is that when you get a component looking like this it is difficult for us to identify the challenges like we cannot tell what sort of surface finish is required are these internal orifices of critical uh, importance or not do we have any uh, freedom to make modifications in this or not so basically when you're reverse engineering the component you have a very uh, close interaction with the manufacturers or the client to find out and to get their approval at various stages because they will have a good understanding of what the application of the part is and once that is done you go ahead with the generation of the reverse engineered uh, STL uh, file and from that you develop a CAD file so basically this is the sort of uh, image we got from reverse engineering and you'll see that the damages were also captured so we do not know what is the requirement for surface finish here does this region have a critical uh, functionality or not how important is this internal orifices and things of that nature so these are informations which we need to get and then based on that only we can design our model once the model is done we selected the material mm -hmm. stainless steel 17-4 ph for fabrication we reduce the weight as well of the component by using a material which is more newer than the legacy uh, component material and then we went one of the challenges we faced was that since there are orifices here we are not going to be able to make support structures there and even if we do make support structures there you're not going to be able to remove those support structures so again we had to work with the part orientation so you will see that we made it in this angle so that it's again self-supporting and we have given support structures on the external region so that it is possible for us to machine it out at a later point and get the desired surface finish and following that we went forward with the simulation to do the thermomechanical analysis and the build simulation to see if there is residual stresses, deformations, peak temperature, whether it's within, within limit and things of that and those uh, a few other related uh, topics. And once they were all satisfied, only then we move forward with the part fabrication. And the important thing in the free, the advantage of uh, additive manufacturing is that from this point to getting the finished product or at least to reach this point, we did it in a matter of three weeks. And that sort of time and that sort of a uh, 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 gap which is being reduced so basically your lead time for the component is significantly reduced when you're doing from reverse engineering to uh, the simulation stage and even after that this component uh, production barely took about a day's time so all in all about within a month's time from a reverse engineering a legacy component to having it the new component fabricated was possible with additive manufacturing, which normally was not possible with other techniques. And here is another example. This, like I said, is the feed on for uh, space application. Now, this component, again, this was not a legacy component, so we did not have to work with the reverse engineering aspect. But this component again the positional accuracy of these columns is quite important which is and that is by far the most important aspect of this component second challenge is that these uh, walls have a thickness of about uh, two or three mm thickness and that was a challenge again so fabricating a component of this height 
and with a thickness or as thin as this is a challenge and when it comes to the position initially these were individually fabricated components so basically 19 uh, parts which are now made into a single part so you had 19 different components again since it's space application input output of radio frequency waves is the application so for space applications we need to consider that welding the component will result in rf leakages so by manufacturing it as a single uh, entity we have eliminated the rf leakages additionally the positional aspect since it's a single component with these ribs and uh, struts for um, structural integrity they have also ensured that we maintain the functional aspect of the component and as a result we have come up with a part which is monolithized and a single bulk unit rather than having it fabricated with a, a conventional technique so when it comes to design for additive manufacturing you need to understand that the freedom which design for additive manufacturing gives us isn't just because of our uh, you know out of the box way of thinking it is the fabrication process of additive manufacturing the layer by layer fabrication process that enables us to explore the out of the box th design thinking which we generally prefer for additive manufacturing so again these are the this is the northwest fleet cluster it was you realized in the GSAT-19 uh, satellite, and this was India's first uh, relatively manufactured component, which is currently in space for the last four years. So again, original component, so we did not have to reverse engineer it. Then, of course, designing the component, overhangs, fillets, those kind of things had to be looked, and we had to modify the design. And we use SolidWorks, but you can pretty much use any design software. Again, when it comes to design considerations, the support designs, the aspect ratio, that is basically the surface finish, which we get the self-supporting uh, regions, all these we have to again analyze with the help of a software and basically Magix by Materialize is a software which has been in the industry for quite some time and it has improved and has been refined with the inputs of various industry people who use this software. So this is something which you'll find is being commonly utilized. And we go through this software for the design considerations. And lastly, we simulate the, the, uh, the build uh, file using thermomechanical build simulations for acetyl stressors and, and the entire whatever is requirement that we need to uh, basically have a look at before going into the fabrication so the process flow in general remains same but again various applications will have various uh, constraints and those are things that you will only come across when you look at the component in a more detailed manner and that is where the design for additive manufacturing plays a crucial role i will now be moving into a wipro case study this is something which we for a drone basically a quadcopter so this basically has four different uh, motors and a body where the various electronic units go so basically this component was fabricated using al si uh, sorry the material is aluminium al6061 the entire weight was initially 411 grams and you will find that the dimensions are close to 300 by 300 while the height is quite less. So this basically makes use of the entire build chamber or the build area which is available to us. Now normally entrepreneurs and you will find that even among college students there is a, this one for fabricating their own drones. You will find lots of students have done, made their own drones and things of that uh, nature. So news regarding that is something we hear on a daily basis. When it comes to additive manufacturing, and we took a standard uh, uh, baseline design, and we did the analysis of this, and we found that the maximum stress induced is 25.3 MPa, but the factor of safety for this design is 9.5. So you generally don't need such a high factor of safety when it comes to designing a component. 
So what we found is that the part is heavily over designed and we can make some changes when we consider additive manufacturing as a production technique. True for conventional manufacturing, this may shape may have been required, but for additive, we found that there are lots of ways we could make more changes. We also found that the max deflections are in these regions with a, uh, the value being 0 0.286 mm. So when you look at design for additive manufacturing or topology optimization of a component, we basically classify it into non-design space and design space. So non-design spaces are the regions where the motors are present and we do not want to affect this in any way because the functionality is completely being altered. We also have design space. So basically the ones which you see in from these regions can be designed and the design can be varied as needed to meet the requirement. When you go for topology optimization, sometimes the software itself will predict and it will give you designs which are unorthodox, more organic to be precise. You will find that this optimized result, it looks kind of, uh, it's not something you would normally see. And, but this is something which was given to us by the software itself. You put in the parameters for optimization. What are the factors you need to maintain and what it cannot uh, increase. So, for example, we had a constraint of two uh, factor of sa safety and we made it basically to minimize the mass as much as possible and we ended up with this design. As a result, we went with the final model and we found that the material since uh, AL6061 was used for conventional fabrication, ALSI 10 MG was a suitable replacement for additive manufacturing. We found that we reduced the weight from roughly 411 grams to around 132 grams, mainly because the material has been reduced. We have increased the height, but we have made the dimensions to be almost the same as well. And further, when we went ahead with the analysis or the structural analysis of the component, we found that the max stress is 93.6 whereas the factor of safety from nine point change has been brought down to 2.03. And the displacement is a bit high in this case, two mm, which is required for the motor uh, mobility and for motor operation. So this is how the final comparison looks between the original design and the optimized design. You'll find that the original design, you know, the factor of safety was high, the weight was high, and as a result, when the optimized design, when you look at it, the factor of safety is reduced and the weight is also reduced. We also found that the exact calculation that the weight was reduced by about 68%. So this is a prime example of how design for additive manufacturing and topology uh, optimization in general helps additive manufacturing reach its uh, full potential. And this, for this specific reason, the design uh, designers are people with who need to have a very good uh, out of the box thinking, especially for uh, this uh, additive manufacturing uh, technology. And mainly because the, the out of the box thinking, it's difficult to get this once you have been in the industry for a longer period of time. We need to incorporate these sort of uh, ideologies into students and, you know, um, people from a rather younger age so that they have the freedom and the vision to uh, not be uh, constrained by conventional uh, design thinking. And that is what design for additive manufacturing tries to bring out. Uh, and the various applications are just endless. To summarize things, so like I said, basically AM enables manufacturing for design and not the other way around because the advantages of DFAM are only advantages because additive manufacturing is the processing or the fabrication technique. So that is something we need to keep in mind because design for additive manufacturing normally cannot be utilized for conventional uh, manufacturing techniques and it may not be possible to do so. However, design for additive manufacturing is the most important strategy in unleashing the true potential of uh, 
additive manufacturing because without design for additive manufacturing, it is difficult for us to uh, make the maximum utilization of what additive manufacturing has to offer. And that is the summary of today's session. So if you if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, yeah, any queries from the participants? Anyone having any queries from the participants may please unmute yourself and you may ask. Or you can write on the chat box. Mondi sir, you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am here, sir. Yeah. So, anything you'd like to say? Sir, it is fine, sir. From my side, it is fine. Good presentation, sir. Thank you okay. so much. Any other questions from design aspects or even maybe from some other aspects? Because I have a my profile is more into R and D for additive manufacturing. So anything from material aspects or the process in general, if anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, Karthik, I just wanted to ask uh, what are the different facilities you are currently having at uh, Wipro 3D? At Wipro 3, um, okay, yeah, this is something I can, I, let me just share you my screen so that uh, it's easier to. Okay. This is something I generally get asked. So I make it a point not to. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, visible. Yeah. So basically, when we say Wipro 3D in general, uh, people think of the Wipro Limited, which is basically the IT and the RD related uh, section. But we at Wipro Infrastructure basically work with hydraulics, aerospace. And we also have the Wipro consumer care and lighting and basically additive manufacturing or Wipro 3D comes under the Wipro infrastructure engineering. So we at Wipro 3D have a, a set of um, offerings for institutions. So basically when we have interactions with clients or either industries or uh, uh, institutions to be precise, Basically, we have the AM technologies. So we have centers in some cases for R&D purposes or for in case the professors from various institutions are not able to have access to the machines. We allow them to utilize our machines. We help them with some various material characterizations and testings, those facilities we have. Additionally, we have designed for additive manufacturing and DFAM, which we offer as a this is not just for our own fabrication, but for, for clients as well. Uh, in terms of uh, institutions, we also offer uh, three credit programs and basically courses and for training and projects as well. And lastly, we, and we also have IoT labs, which we uh, basically deliver for various institutions. And along with 3D printers, we have a couple of in-house 3D printers for FDM fuse deposition modeling, as well as DLP, which we have fabricated and developed basically for a dental application for a medical college. So basically digital light processing, a type of polymer based uh, uh, 3D printing is something we have developed and soon we'll, we'll be going to the market with that. So FDM and DLP are also something. Aside from that, since we metal is our primarily area of uh, strength, we do funded uh, R&D proposals with various uh, universities. And we also consult with a lot of industries to give them uh, research oriented uh, assistance. Of course, turnkey uh, uh, centers are also something we offer from conceptualization to realization. And lastly, implant training for various students and even uh, industrial personnel. So we at Wipro 3D in general, we focus primarily on metals. That is something we take pride in, but we do have expertise for FTM as well as uh, DLP uh, printing. Aside from that, basically when raw materials come, we have a quality lab for uh, raw material testing and characterization because although we basically get all the raw materials imported from uh, various organizations outside India, we have found that the quality of powder varies from 
uh, supplier to supplier. And in India, we found that the indigenously developed materials aren't of the required standard, as in the parts which we get have more porosities or the, or the structural integrity is less. So in order to cater for that, we have a material testing facility as well. Aside from that, we have a powder-based, uh, selective laser sintering-based uh, equipments in-house for polymer-based printings. And yeah, that's how I think about it. So we have, we cover the entire additive manufacturing uh, range what you call requirements for the industry. And as one of the in organizations in the AM industry, while metal is our primary focus, we do have uh, facilities for the other uh, fabrication techniques as well. And one thing of note is that the electron beam melting, which is a rather newer technology for um, additive manufacturing. So EBM is something I worked with when I was in Sweden in general in collaboration basically the technology is patented by a company called arkham ebm which is a part of ge additive and they are the sole manufacturers of this technology so that is something we are trying to develop in collaboration with the iisc and it is almost towards the end of its development so we are trying to diversify into newer technologies but uh, in terms of additive manufacturing the entire uh, whatever the requirement you see from an industry perspective is something we we have covered within our plant at uh, Bangalore. Okay, uh, thank you. That was uh, so. You have got a lot of facilities, and hopefully, um, students or uh, institutes can collaborate. Uh, yes, any researchers, especially if when it comes to material, because in. Uh, 3D printing in general, we do not have the amount of materials which is available for metal 3D printing or metal additive manufacturing is quite less. So, develop uh, we have materials like stainless steel, a couple of titanium and nickel based alloys. Uh, but basically, the reflective materials are something which is difficult to be fabricated because of the reflective nature, the laser, basically the energy which is being delivered is kind of less. So newer materials are always being developed. And in terms of research, if any PhD candidates or professors are interested in, that is also a uh, sort of a facility we provide. So that is also something you can explore. And of course, design for additive manufacturing, we have had uh, quite a uh, detailed expertise in that were mainly because of our several years of working for various uh, applications. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Karthik. Uh, for yes, thank you so time. much for the opportunity. Yeah, uh, hopefully we will be in touch in future and uh, let us see. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karthik. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. So uh, with this, we come to the end of the uh, session of this last day of this entrepreneurship development program. Uh, we will soon be following it up with the validatory session. So I request all the participants to kindly be there. We will be starting the validatory session soon. end of this uh, ADP, which has been going on since 21st of February. So before moving on, uh, I would just like to request a few of our participants to kindly share their feedback. Any participants, uh, please, you can unmute yourself and you can share your feedback for the program. Anyone? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, please. I'm Khan Puspam and I'm a student of an IT at Arunachal Pradesh and a student of civil engineering first year. So I want, I'm, I'm glad to attend this uh, workshop because uh, I really wanted to know how, how the things are printed 3D. I, I watch, I used to watch a lot of videos on YouTube, but, uh, but by this workshop, I came to know the back, uh, what the back uh, in the workshop, what goes there, what how to make this, that. And uh, I am really grateful that uh, the NIT Arunachal Pradesh held this. And uh, we got to learn many things about that. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Th uh, thank you. Thank you, Hemant. 
Uh, anyone else who would like to share? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rahul, and uh, I just want to tell one one thing that uh, this uh, workshop is really very uh, informative, and uh, you organized in such a way that uh, you invited such a good resource persons, and they have said very. Uh, knowledgeable things uh, some things uh, we didn't discover till that they have said that things also and uh, some hands on uh, uh, sessions are also there and in that session we also able to grab some knowledge about the metal 3d printing uh, personally i can say that i have never seen that machine before uh, practically and uh, they have shown that machine and uh, always i thought that um, online mode of webinar is not uh, very uh, 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 successful but uh, in this session i i got um, uh, what um, that uh, uh, some information that uh, in online mode of webinar also we can grab some knowledge because uh, when they are uh, some resource person are coming to institute at that time they will not able to show their workshop but in this online mode, they are able to show that uh, show their workshop and how these uh, machines are working. So it was very nice experience. And thank you, thank you, sir, for organizing such a great workshop. Thank you, Rahul. Yes, uh, we have had a very good look at the advanced manufacturing lab at NID3G during the live demonstration. Uh, that was really uh, helpful, I guess. Yeah. Any any other participants who would like to share? His views. Anyone else? Good afternoon, sir. Sir, I'm yes, Saurabh yes. from second year. Good morning. Good good afternoon, director, sir. Sir, it was a very helpful session for us. In the times of COVID, we didn't expect we would get such facilities from our college side. We are glad that we were a part of this workshop. Sir, it was a really nice experience. They used all the devices present and uh, they tried to show as much as possible. They kept a different camera from a different angle and they were speaking and they were helping us out in understanding each and everything properly and as good as they can. They tried their best and the sessions were were such that I got a deep idea. I may not understand the, all of the things properly, but I got a brief idea and that's enough for me. And it's really good that uh, Subhajit sir conducted this program. And we look forward to such helpful sessions in future also, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It was a great pleasure to watch the program. Thank you. Thank you, Saurav. Uh, anyone else would like to share? Uh, so good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yes. I am Haskell yes. Aldas from EC first year. Yes, sir, this session was really helpful, and the live demonstration was really helping in the explanatory things. I really I wanted to learn the 3D printing and this session really explained everything that how to design the 3D models in the computer and how to print it and how to scan things. It, it, it was really a wonderful session. So I'm really grateful that I was a part of this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vaskar. Said, you may speak. Uh, sir, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon, director, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to the coordinator and who have uh, performed this program. Uh, and uh, I have learned very much thing from this uh, 3D printing program. And I personally want to learn about 3D printing and the live demonstration and uh, the hands-on practice which were they were uh, teaching to us was very much attractive and very much uh, knowledgeable. And uh, we. Uh, and uh, um, uh, at last, I want to say thanks to all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Said. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, Vishay. Uh, 
team good afternoon, good afternoon all and uh, everyone uh, before that i don't know anything about the 3d printing i think that uh, this, this is such type of 2d printing which are shown in 3d in 3d but uh, i think it it was great uh, to us to know about the 3d printing and uh, and by this workshops we also know that uh, how a company claims their warranty uh, claims their warranty ki how much uh, this product is uh, uh, work 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 works and uh, how the how how they are made up of by the different layers and uh, thank you such type of workshop okay thank you abhishek yeah thank you thank you abhishek thank you sir okay uh, so uh, now i would like to request our director sir and a pi in charge of this project uh, professor pinakesha mohanta sir to kindly say a few words Sir, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mohanty and Dr. Subhajit, other colleagues and their participants. Uh, I'm very happy that a workshop on 3D flexible manufacturing and 3D printing has been carried out for the last five days. And this is the need of the hour, actually, at least from the mechanical engineering point of view. Uh, mechanical students can always learn, but other category of students like from electronics and others can also join in this type of program. This uh, flexible manufacturing is becoming very, very important for sustainability of the industry in India. And by knowing this technology, it will be helping us to at least attribute in two different directions. One may be uh, the participants after completion of their career can choose their higher studies in the same direction, or they can go to industry directly in the same line. Second important aspect is one, if one is interested, they, uh, he or she can go for entrepreneurship development through this route. So uh, this will be definitely helpful, but my realization is that a five day is not enough and particularly online teaching is not enough to realize or perceive the uh, 3D printing. Uh, as someone was telling, it was uh, look like 2D printing. So because in the, he was in the, on the uh, online mode. So my suggestion is, we have now established a startup cell, startup cell in NIT Ornasal Pradesh. We have a research building. So in that startup cell, one of the component is our 3D printer. And also our organizers are having their own 3D printer. So once the student come back here to NIT, they can have their own perception and own idea to learn how to make 3D printed objects. Then in the stay, uh, next step will be for multiplication of the object. That way entrepreneurship can grow very easily. So I think a practical demonstration is very, very important. And our organizer will be helping the participant in next phase, at least to go for practical demonstration and practical perception. Uh, anyway, it was a good program. Many research persons have given ideas and methodologies on 3D printing and flexible manufacturing. So, so this will be helping us through a Nectar project. And I welcome you all. And I wish best of luck for each one of you, for Fusar and Dubir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words and inspiration to all of our participants. Uh, so now I would like to request uh, Dr. Prashesh Kumar Mohanty, sir, uh, coordinators for this EDP, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Sir, please. Thank you, sir. sir can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Okay. Yes, please. 
So good afternoon to all. So finally, we come to end of this five days EDP on flexible 3D printing operation and prototype development. So first of all, I would like to express my heartful gratitude to our honorable director, sir, for his generous support and always inspiring us to organize such type of uh, entrepreneurship development program. And this EDP will help the participant in extending their skills and capabilities and necessary in the field of 3D printing directions. We also thankful to our actor that is DST government of India for sponsoring this enterprise development program. We also congratulate all the participants and really happy to say that one twenty numbers of participants taking part in this week long program and the participants have gained lots of knowledge on the flexible 3 printing operations and prototype developments. It starts from uh, that is your concepts of sketching in uh, also knowledge on this 3D printing softwares, 3D modeling, and live demonstration of this 3D print metal 3D printers, also 3D scanners. So the participants are very fortunate to have got their exposure to the re different resource persons from the various reputed organizations, institutes like NIT Tichi, IIT Jammu, then TRTC Guwahati. I thank to my colleague and program coordinator, Dr. Subhachit Das sir, we are able to organize wonderful week-long FDP, also manage these technical aspects. I also really appreciate our effort to our PhD scholars to help us to arrange this FDP. I thank to all the participants to listen. In the last, we hope definitely this week-long EDP on flexible 3D printing operation and prototype development. The participants acquired the knowledge in the field of product development through 3D printer. Thank you. We hope we shortly we'll arrange a, uh, this type of ATP program offline board so that part participant can see the, the real time how this 3D printer is used to develop the product. It will be more helpful to the participants and they can gain more knowledge on the 3D printing. Thank you. Thank you all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohandi sir. Uh, so before concluding, I request all the participants, uh, director sir and Mohandi sir to kindly switch on the video so that we can a few uh, snaps of the validity session. I request all the participants to please start on their video. And I request Ashok to kindly take a few uh, photographs of the validity session. Ashok, you may please take a few uh, snaps. I request the participants to please switch on their video. Please. <clears throat> Ashok, you please take few uh, screenshots. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank so you. With this, Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. Okay, bye, bye, sir. So with this, we come to the end of the validity session. Uh, the, the feedback link will be shared in the chat box. So I request all the participants to kindly please give your feedbacks uh, in the link that will be provided in the chat box. So we hope to meet you soon uh, physically in the campus. And uh, probably in future, we will be conducting few ADPs uh, physically, where you will be able to see the live demonstration of the programs. So thank you all for joining us for all these five days. Ashok, you may please uh, share the feedback link. Yeah, the feedback link is available in the chat box. Uh, please uh, put on your feedback. And the certificates for this FDP, uh, for this EDP will be issued uh, within two weeks time. So. I request all the participants to have some patience. We will be issuing the certificates shortly and feedback will be compulsory for receiving the certificate. So please uh, do give us the feedback. Thank you all. So with this, we come to the end of this program. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Th